morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ankita Shivastav, and I'm a master's student at the Technical University of Munich. And I'm writing my master thesis with this cover G. Uh, and today I will be talking about deep learning models for disaggregation of household load data. And what I would be considering would be a balance between the industry and the academy. So uh, we have seen so many talks where, we, where people say that, OK, this works in the academy, but when we try to implement it uh, for the real scenario, there are a lot of problems that, that occur. So yeah, I would try to talk about some uh, balances that we could achieve. So uh, first of all, uh, we see that um, in a lot of literature, uh, the normal pipeline that is used for NILM is that we get the raw data, we extract the features uh, from the data, we perform some kind of clustering techniques, and uh, we label, uh, which basically leads to the disaggregate, uh, disaggregated data. And in this approach, uh, each of these um, steps can be optimized but in the end, it is very difficult to optimize for disaggregation. We at Discovery, uh, we use deep learning for dis disaggregating our raw data. So we uh, pre-process the data, uh, do some kind of regularizations, augmentations on the data, and then we um, uh, use deep learning models to train and uh, basically disaggregate the data using the deep learning models. So um, deep learning is a very heuristic domain in the sense it is very uh, domain specific. Uh, what works uh, for maybe speech uh, recognition may not be the best for image recognition and so on. So it's like you really have to train and test models for your area of application to see what works the best. Uh, so there are three approaches that are usually taken. Um, for a uh, deep learning domain. Uh, first one is that we try to modify an existing neural network to reach better results by maybe adding more layers, um, adding new regularization techniques, and things like that. Uh, the second approach is by transferring the exact uh, existing architecture into a completely new research field to perform a completely different task. And the third one is um, to basically de develop new architectures or some completely different regularization techniques uh, that perform better than the previous state of art in that particular field. So uh, talking about non-intrusive load monitoring, um, there have been, um, in terms of neural networks, uh, uh, there have been more recently uh, the state of art which have been uh, considered as uh, LSTMs uh, and GRUs. So we have seen a consensus here uh, talking to the public and hearing from everybody in previous questions. I've heard a lot that uh, people think or believe that um, the recurrent neural networks are the way to go for time series data. But um, disclaimer, in the last one or two years, things have changed a little bit and re research has shown that uh, convolutional neural networks are also able to perform really well on the time series data. So um, in my project, uh, in my work with Discovery, I have uh, basically trained RNNs, so LSTMs and GRUs, um, also tried some different uh, models with LSTM, so what I've trained is also an encoder-decoder model uh, LSTM. And, um, and then what I've also tried to um, experiment with is the temporal convolutional neural networks, which is TCN in short. So um, just to explain all of these architectures really quickly, um, so recurrent neural networks um, if in, seen in the vanilla sense, uh, they have this problem of exploding and vanishing radians. Uh, that's why LSTMs were introduced. So they basically use different gates or gated structures to cope up with the exploding and vanishing gradient problems. So here in this diagram, uh, use, oops, sorry. 
Yeah, the, the three red circles with the sigmoid signals that you see are the three gates. Uh, the first one being the forget gate, which basically uh, tells the cell how much of the previous information needs to be forgotten. So um, sigmoid basically uh, transforms the, the value from 0 to 1. Uh, and this is very useful because the value of 0 here would mean that you forget all of the previous data. And the value of 1 in this gate would mean that you keep all of the previous data. Um, the, second, uh, the second red uh, circle that you see with the sigmoid function is the input gate, which basically um, specifies how much of the current input needs to be included. Um, then uh, the blue circles that we are seeing here are basically the tan edge activation functions. They are used just to regulate the flow in the, in the cell. And uh, the, th uh, the third uh, circle is, is the third gate, which is the output gate, which basically determines what the hidden state and the cell state would be that would be passed on into the next cell. So as you can see, it is a pretty complicated structure with a lot of parameters to be optimized. Um, so that's why there was, uh, there was a little uh, different approach taken to LSTM architectures. And uh, these are called the gated recurrent unit architecture. This reduces the number of gates from three to two, naming the reset gate and update gate. And it also reduces the number of states. So in the, in the previous um, LSTM, there were two states, cell state and hidden state. But in the GRU architecture, there's only hidden state that is carried forward. So the reset gate basically kind of works like the forget gate. It, uh, determines how much of the previous uh, values need to be forgotten. And the update gate um, basically determines how much of the input from this cell state needs to be carried forward to, to the next cell state. Um, in an encoder-decoder uh, architecture, um, there is basically um, your input goes into the encoder model, which is basically encoded. So there is a bottleneck. And then uh, there is a decoder model that decodes the data. And then there are some dense layers, which basically then are used to disaggregate the data. Um, OK, so talking about the CNNs uh, taking over time series uh, recently. So with, with the standard convolutional neural networks, what happens is that um, it considers uh, pixels all around a pixel. So basically, it is used for image recognition. And um, what, what the temporal uh, architecture has uh, made it different in a way that it uses dilated and, convolu uh, and causal convolutions uh, onto the 1D data. So in the case of um, non-intrusive load monitoring data, what we get is a 1D time series data. So yeah, it basically um, uses uh, 1D data to, to um, predict the, the next uh, time steps. Uh, since I've mentioned two terms here, dilated and causal, I would like to explain them quickly. So causal convolutions uh, basically mean that, that the output at a certain time step depends only on the previous time steps and not the future. So this is very helpful in real-time applications of NILM. Um, so well, in the real-time, you can't really have the future data, so it wouldn't make sense to train it with the future data. And uh, with dilated convolutions is basically uh, when a number of input values is skipped uh, to, for the filters to be applied. And this basically helps with um, getting more of a receptive field. So uh, yeah, um, as you can see here, these represent the dilated causal convolutions. So in, in the first layer, you can see that the dilation is, there is one dilation. In the second layer, there are um, two dilations, and so on. So with, with dilations, we basically can increase the receptive field of how many previous time steps would, uh, would affect 
the output at a certain time step. Yeah, um, so basically this is just a method to calculate the receptive field. It is interesting because um, sometimes we, for, for different appliances, we would like to have different kinds of receptive field. Maybe appliances that, that are like working for a short period of time, they do not um, need to look at much further in, in the past. So yeah, uh, with basically stacking different um, uh, residual mo modules, we can increase the receptive field of the convolutional neural networks. So uh, why, why use uh, TCN is uh, because they have been shown to uh, exhibit more memory than RNNs with the same capacity. So um, because in, in the RNNs there are too many uh, parameters to be, to be uh, trained, uh, this is really reduced in, with convolutions. And uh, it has been seen to perform really well on, on different tasks uh, in different areas. Um, also, uh, one, one more um, important factor here is that it is very easy to parallelly train uh, the model, so, which is not possible with the recurrent neural networks. And yeah, we have seen that it has outperformed RNNs in probably like nine of the, of the fields um, yeah, with the state of the art. So yeah, it was interesting to look into temporal convolution neural networks. So um, talking about um, what what I did, I what I used for training was uh, one uh, hertz data, and it was from a residential city uh, setting with um, 522 houses in Sweden, which were measured for up to 1.5 years. And um, so I'm, I'm using some kind of regular, regularization technique. Um, in TCNs, I'm also using dropout. Um, also, for, uh, like in, all, in all, all, of the, all of the architectures, I'm using data augmentation to make the models more robust over um, overfitting. So uh, usually we have seen that um, uh, you know, to experiment, people add a certain amount of base load to to the input. But uh, what I have uh, tried uh, doing different here is trying to add the real world uh, appliance data from like s certain number of appliances. In some cases, also eleven appliances. So what you can see here is the the submetering data from air conditioner, which is in the blue, and what is in the orange is the augmented aggregate. So it, it's basically just making uh, the data more um, generalized to be, to be trained, to be closer to the real world um, data. So um, yeah, so I would not really be talking about the accuracy, accuracy measures uh, today because um, yeah, it, it depends on different settings and different input lengths, and you know there are too many factors affecting that. But what is very interesting in an industrial setting is optimizing the operational uh, costs, or you know the the costs that are um, occurred with with the training and um, uh, training and testing of of the models. So uh, here is a comparison between the number of training parameters. As uh, Patrick mentioned, that it is good to know how many parameters are being trained because that in some way also affects uh, the time that is being taken to train a particular model. So um, just a quick overview. So the, I have trained two LSTM models, one GRU, two uh, encoder-decoder LSTM, and a one TCN. So the GRU model is basically um, has the same number of layers as the longer uh, LSTM model. But as I mentioned before, because the parameters in the GRU are reduced, you can see that um, the parameters in GRU are almost comparable to, to the shorter LSTM that is implemented which I think is really cool. Also we can see that with the convolutions um, with application of filters and uh, or 
kernels in in CN, uh, TCN, um, the number of parameters to be trained is really reduced. Um, another thing that is very interesting to see is how much um, training time it takes per epoch to train each of these models. Um, so uh, it's it's yeah it's again interesting to see that. Uh, GRU is taking almost um, as much time per epoch as the shorter LSTM. Uh, yeah, so TCN is taking a little bit more time per epoch, but again, there is another uh, aspect which is very important to consider is time to reach the optimum comparison because um, training neural network models is all about reaching the optimum um, and so even if um, it takes 300 seconds, but if it takes like 10,000 epochs to, to train the model to reach the optimum, it's not, it's not a good model. So here we are comparing um, basically the number of epochs or the time that would be, uh, that was taken to reach the optimum for, for each of the networks. Uh, as you can see here, uh, I have, only mentioned one LSTM architecture. That's because the, the shorter LSTM was not really performing so well. And um, yeah, I trained the models for over 250 epochs, but I used um, early stopping. So basically when the validation error starts getting bigger than, than the training error, so it basically just then stops training. And uh, yeah, it is interesting to see that um, although uh, for each epoch TCN was taking more time, it takes lesser time to, to reach the optimum. Um, so, um, yeah, as I mentioned in the training data set, um, so I used, from all of the data, I used 80% of the data for training and 20% for testing. And of the 80% used for um, training, I used 80% of that for uh, actual training and 20% of that for validation. Uh, so in the testing, uh, I, I think it was really important to not just test on the data set that was used for training but also um, maybe different data with the same or similar resolution, which would give a, a better idea of, uh, for the application in the real world scenario, because we want our models to be more generalized and not just work for one appliance in one house, um, but to be applicable in a little bigger setting. Uh, what I also did was I used overlapping time windows. So I um, uh, used different window sizes of from 300 seconds to uh, 1500 seconds. And um, then during, during the test phase, what I did was since for each time step, I had um, n number of predictions, I tried to optimize the result for particular time step by taking um, a mean or, or an average of, of that time step for the n number of predictions. Uh, so these models can also be used for um, performing binary classification uh, to say if the appliance was on or off based on a certain threshold that was provided. Uh, since I'm using uh, one versus rest classifier, so there's one model trained for one appliance. So it is, it is, it can uh, directly be also used for binary classification of, for the appliances. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So the next steps for me will, would be to explore some semi-supervised learning approaches, uh, because as we have seen that. We have a lot of unlabeled data, so it would be really helpful to have some approaches wherein we can use, say, 10% or 20% of the labeled data, but rest uh, unlabeled. So that there are some ne uh, network ar architectures such as ladder networks, and um, you know, th I think that they can be a good um, experiment to do with with uh, data that we have for NIL. Um, yeah, another thing would be interesting would be to uh, have transfer learning and also as P 
Peter already mentioned to to publish uh, the models so that you know instead of starting the training from scratch in terms of deep learning, we have seen that. Um, yeah, if we already have a trained model, it is very easy to optimize it for for a more defined uh, task. Um, also, as Feng mentioned, um, it would be interesting to incorporate some sort of user feedback to fine tune the trained models. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions?